Welcome to Blue Monday. Uh, I'm joined today by Dave and Roger, as ever. Um, after a weekend where Everton pretty much threw away a really good opportunity to get to three points against the team who've not had a single win on the road. In fact, they've been beaten in every game this season and they went down to 10 men for more than half the game. Uh, so we'll, we'll pick through that. We've got a little bit of a schedule that Roger sent me on uh, on Saturday evening after the game. So we're going to talk apathy, coaching, replacements for dice and teachers' pets. That, that's going to be the theme of this show. Uh, so we'll, we'll get stuck into it, lads. Um, Rog, the apathy thing, was it the crowd, the players, or just the whole general feeling around the club that you thought? I think I, I picked it up on a couple of uh, sort of posts th- through Blue Sky and a bit of Twitter. And I should say, <laughs> this, this schedule that you talk about was was, was uh, produced by me after a gin-tasting experience on Saturday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, 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 it may flow, it may not. But, I mean, apathy, look, Daish's legacy. I think I think you can sum up the Daish era in, in 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 that word because he has he has made us so disinterested. But it's not just the fans; it's the players. It's everybody at the football club is just treading water at best. And the minute a little wave comes along, we go underneath the water. Um, fans have just they are exhausted, absolutely exhausted, and and. Um, I, I, you, you picked up on a bit of it, I think, in the post-match with the boys. Uh, a couple of them mentioned apathy. That you know, it just—we almost don't care anymore because there's nothing to care about. There is nothing on the pitch to care about. Um, it, it's just football for the sake of football, but it's a pointless style of football, which is at most getting you a point a game, which is at most getting you a goal a game. You know. We've scored 10 goals all season. We've scored three in the last six games and we've failed to score in four of the last six matches. That is not entertainment. It's nothing like entertainment. I'm not seeing passion yet again. I don't think we had a player booked on Saturday. Um, There's just nothing there. It's an empty shell, which is the consequence we know of eight, nine years of mismanagement under Mashiri and a fairly big chunk of mismanagement before that too. And, and, And I think, I think the fans are just exhausted. Um, and and I, I, je- I see apathy in the players. I mean, DCL is going through the motions. Um, uh, the centre-backs, you know, Tarkovsky, barring his occasional stupid lunge on people and attempt to get booked. It, they're going through the motions. Everyone is going through the motions. And, and ironically, you know, Ashley Young is almost the player of the season because the motions that he's go, he goes through are of a higher standard than the rest of them. And I see, you know, fans are falling out now. Of course, the Everton fans have always been quite passionate and, and quite, you know, vociferous and, 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 and set themselves high standards. But they're now falling out because whilst they know that it's shit, they don't want to hear fans around them telling them it's shit for 90 minutes. And, and I really feel that because I've been in both of those sort of situations where I'm fed up with people moaning and I've been the one moaning. And that was even probably in the Silver and Cumin era. And I just think there's nothing there. You know, you said the atmosphere was so flat. The 1878s do a great job to try and get the crowd up. Now they're getting grief off people because someone was standing in my seat waving a flag. I mean, Christ, it's just exhausting. The whole thing is exhausting. And, and, and I don't think we care. And I don't think the players care. And that is because, fundamentally, Sean Dyche doesn't give a shit. And, and I don't care if that, you know, if that's inappropriate. He knows his job is safe. They've come out this morning saying, oh, he's got the full confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just an incredibly frustrating set of circumstances. And and I think what we're left with is apathy because somebody sent me a text just after Southampton scored yesterday. And he said, this is what Sean Dyche has done to us. We can't even enjoy mm-hmm. Southampton scoring a goal against the Red Shite because actually it would have been a bad result for us. God almighty. Yeah, this apathy. is it, isn't it? It, it's like it's not just sucking the enjoyment out of watching Everton. It's just sucking the enjoyment out of everything to do with football. When you when you can't enjoy the Reds going behind, it's like it's pretty much game over for me. That I um, just want to pick up with you, Dave. I think one of the most surprising things for me on Saturday was when Brentford did go down to ten men. There was a bit of jeering from the crowd, obviously because a player had been sent off for them, but there wasn't that 
lift that you get. Do you know when you go down to when the opposition go down to ten men, you like right lads into these. It was five minutes left of the first half, so we really could have gone for it, try and get a goal before half time. And then when the second half started, maybe again, there was, but there was none of that. Not even when the injury time was announced. I think people were surprised it was only four minutes because it should have been more because they were doing a lot of time wasting in that second half. But at no point during that game did I feel the crowd were like, come on, let's go, let, let's go for this. And, you know, I, I was speaking to Rob last night and, and I think it is, that's on the players to set the tempo, isn't it, for that? You know, we can only do so much. Like you said, Rod, you know, we've got the, the flags at the start, the 1878s, they all that. That didn't even work at the start of the game this time round. And it should have done because we started off quite well. But I don't know, I think that the life has been drained out of all of us. And it does remind me of when Sam Allardyce was in charge now, where we're just turning up to watch the game, but not really that bothered about watching the game. But that, I just want to pick up on that, Dave, because that was surprising that there was no real push from the fans to like, get behind the plays and like lift the energy. There was just nothing. Mm. Well, firstly, I'd say, you know, fans aren't stupid or by and large aren't stupid. I know we all have different opinions <clears throat> and you would refer to others who are stupid and don't don't agree with what you've got to say. But um, I do have I do have a feeling that when they, when they went down to 10 men, I think everybody to a man, woman and child watching that game would think this is going to be more difficult <laughs> against 10 men. Than, than it was against the eleven, and 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 I say that laughing because that's exactly what uh, Sean Dyche said uh, in in his post match interview, which is obviously quite ridiculous, really. I mean, you, I know for a fact they're going to put all ten, well, all nine behind the ball, aren't they, and, and, and try and stop Everton from scoring by by all means. Um, but you know, it I I think it I think it underlined once again the inevitability that he sets this team up to 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 do. Um, you, you look at the way they were trying to score goals. It was just, yes, they're going to defend deep, of course, but there was, you know, get it out wide to, to Young or Mikhailenko. They'll put a half decent cross in. We'll challenge. They've got a decent few big lads at the back. It was just, it was just so predictable. And uh, I, I think as well what, what Roger was talking about there in, in, in terms of the apathy, in terms of uh, how everybody is looking at this now. Um, I, I, I do. I, I agree in that it feels like a lot of people aren't asked. And by not asked, I think that if you have a look at that Premier League table, um, and I think we've been able to see this, say this the last couple of seasons, obviously the three that got promoted got relegated last season. You could see that happening once again. Um, because Leicester were appalling against Chelsea, obviously sacked their manager, which is um, in, in, in the context of where we are, it shows you what we should be doing. Um, you know, early doors, get rid, see if we can improve. You know, you can't get much worse. Um, funny thing is, they're, what, 16th, relatively comfortable for a promoted side. Um, yet, Everton and what we're playing like um, seems a hell of a lot worse than these. Obviously not in the league table position, but yet it doesn't look any sign, or there is no sign whatsoever of Sean Dice uh, uh, being sacked. But going back to your point there about the crowd itself, yeah, I mean, it, I think it, it reiterates what we've said about the, you know, fans aren't going to react until the players start doing something. And you'll get games like that where, you know, you'll you're hear booing at the end of the game and I know everybody takes the piss out of us. I know the Reds take the piss out of us, don't they? And there's always booing at Goodison Park. But it's <laughs> it's purely justified when you see that sack of shite that we watched against Brentford, what we've generally been like uh, at Goodison. I've banged on quite a lot in, in recent times about Everton looking like a better away side than they do at Goodison. Um, you know, every uh, I'm sure Sean Dice would say it himself if he wasn't um if he wasn't abused for saying it, but it, it did probably just feel like it's a hell of a lot more comfortable playing away from home because Everton fans can't be heard um doing what they do at home. Um by no means would I blame a single Evertonian for having a problem uh at, at Goodison Park, you know. You'll still get many saying, oh, you know, and like Roger alluded to as well, when you're in and amongst the crowd there, obviously people are shouting, saying, oh, you know, get behind the side and things like that. But what is there to get behind? Um, and I know one of the things we're going to go on to talk about is the the, the players that have Sean Dice's favourites, the uh, top of the class, the, the uh, prefects and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, I mean, that word apathy is a perfect way of describing this now because... It, it feels in general that he knows he's got a safe job, so he's got what well, he can say what he likes at the end of it. 
which were all infuriated by. We've had that happen before with, with previous managers. And I actually think the irony in all of this is that we've had this situation many, many times since David Moyes left. That doesn't make it any more comfortable or shouldn't make it any more comfortable for the manager, we, manager we've got because invariably you've got many fans who'll say, well, it never worked last time we did it. It never worked last time we did it, so we shouldn't do it again. The fact that it hasn't worked in the past or never worked in the past, many would say, is no excuse whatsoever for him to keep his job, um, given the way Everton are right now, given the way we're playing, given the way we're sort of sleepwalking to, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll stay up because there's three sides worse than us. That's almost become a cliche, that, in, in recent seasons for us. And I, I feel mm. that we're in a position with Dice now where he's completely safe until any sort of ownership comes in and changes it. Would they change it anyway, thinking let's get to the summer? I think that was many people's way of thinking. But when you see where we are, you know, you, you go forward well, in five weeks' time and we're sitting here with a new year. Everton aren't going to be any better than where they are now. In fact, you would I, I, I would put my house on Everton being worse than where they are right now. I'd be astonished if we're not in the bottom three by then. And if we're not, that would be because of three other sides that are a hell of a lot worse than us. Yeah, it's it's a dangerous what, what position. Gonna, I was just gonna say, sorry, Les, just just before I finish this rant, um <laughs> the side the sides we looked at that were below us through the weekend were all better. They were all better than yeah. Everton. Um, quite comfortably so as well. You look at Wolves, were absolutely brilliant. And we've got them next home game. We've got Wolves. Um, you know, you, you, you're looking at things in, in, in a dangerous way. Um, you know, you've won two games in 12. Goodison were just dropping points, hemorrhaging points, um, which they need to be the ones that we rely upon to get into a relatively safe season so we can go to Bramley Moor. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm infuriated on one end of things, but I'm also shrugging my shoulders and saying, you know, what else can you really expect? Yeah, it's it's a dangerous situation we're in, isn't it? For like for everyone involved, because if there's that much apathy around, this this is where you like you say, Dave, you can't sleepwalk into trouble. Um, and we're in a position in the table where we could quite easily do that. I was looking at the fixtures, and I think a few months ago, well, about a month or so ago, Wolves was the gimme, wasn't it? It was like, yeah, we've got to beat Wolves at home. They've hit a good turn of four, um, obviously to be Fulham away, 4-1. I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't come to Goodison and do that really if they can do it at Fulham. But I think, I genuinely think our best chance of three points before New Year is Forest now because they're on a little bit of a dip. They've got a dreadful December, the same of us. So it could be a case where two teams who are out of form playing each other and that could be a good, you know, a good chance to get three points. But again, they're going well. So it, it's a really, really rough month we've got coming up. And I think just to go back to the Brentford game, I think had we thrown everything at them and the keepers had an absolute blinder of a game and kept us out, you know, we had 27 shots, I think, but only five on target. We never really troubled them. I think two of those were really good saves in the first half that he made, one from a deflected shot that he got down low to in particular, remember. So it's not like if, if we'd thrown everything at them and really gone for it and just been like, oh, do you know what? We did our best there. We just couldn't. We just couldn't break break through. Then I think people would have been all right coming out. It wouldn't have been the reaction that we had. And also, I think the thing that really surprised me was after about five minutes of the second half, it didn't look like eleven v ten at all. Mm. So Brentford, yeah. while he while he did defend like relatively well, he didn't really need to. And you know they were catching us on the break. And it, it, at no point in that second half really did it look like they were down to ten men. And that was the that was the thing that that's kind of unforgivable, I think, for me, which possibly now leads us on to the second point, which is coaching, because I'm not sure what they What's do. That? Exactly. There's no there's no patterns of play. The, the, hmm. the, the amount of short passes we misplace, everything like that, I just, I just don't know what they work on in training because it's certainly not anything with a football. And if it's, if it's dice fitness... I don't think we look particularly fitter than anyone else. It's not like we're running teams off the park, or it doesn't feel that way. Um, Rog, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think um, just before, just let me just say something about Daesh and the crowd, just on that sort of final point. He came out after the game and he said, oh, the crowd were nervous. Right, the crowd put us off. He's, a, he's such an idiot. You know, shall we, shall, we, shall we play behind closed doors then, Sean? Would that be better for you? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, that, you almost want to do that. You almost, yeah. He, he almost seems to be saying the crowd put us off 
I mean, it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. It's an insult. The man's got no humility, and I, and I can't stand it. Um, and just, coaching, sorry, yeah. just, just on that, just on yeah. that quickly, I don't think that was a nervous Goodison on Saturday. Of course it was. We've all, we've all been in Goodison when it's nervous, and that wasn't it. So I don't know what he's talking about there. That was just a dissatisfied Goodison. You know, that was yeah. a, for goodness sake, we're playing 10 men, any chance of having a go. Um, yeah. I mean, there's just no substance to it. There's no substance to him. There's no substance to his coaching team. Um, a, a slight tangent, there was a good piece. I mean, it was a good detailed piece by Mark Douglas on, on Thelwell and the things that had happened in the academy on the eye last week. But, but there was very little detail there. There were a lot of lovely words like scaffolding and projects and ready to go. I read a piece um, on Chelsea on Saturday and, and about their plan, and it was full of detail. It was absolutely full of detail in terms of style of play, recruitment, yeah. statistics, what they were looking at. It was real detail that you could see had been implemented. Of course, the Yanks are a little bit mad there and they've thrown an awful lot of money and signed an awful lot of players, but it's starting to come together because there is detail. And for all of the good intentions of, of you know, taking a journalist behind the scenes at Finch Farm, there was no real detail as to what the hell was going on and what was actually going to make a difference because this style of play we've seen from Sean Dyche is abominable and it is not connected to anything that may or may not be going on at the academy. I have no clue what, uh, Ian Wone and Steve Stone do. I don't know who is coaching the attackers. I don't know who is coaching set pieces uh, because nothing is changing. Uh, nothing is changing. You come out and you say, oh, it's just those key moments. We've just got to get better at the key moments. Well, what? it's your job. You're the coach. What are you actually, actually doing? <laughs> and, and, and it's all the same. There's no overlapping fullbacks. I saw something with... Um, Somebody posted a Mikolenko overlapping run and a great cross in a game, and Mikolenko hasn't made an overlapping run for like two seasons. Um, it's just there's nothing there. There's the, the, there's no improvement. There's no creativity. There's barely a plan A, so there's clearly no plan B. And and who is coaching them? I mean, there was this ridiculous, and I don't know who is pulling these strings. Who, you know, Evertonians, we are, we do know our football. Yes, we can be gobby. Yes, we can be you know, knee-jerk, but like all football fans, you're going to get those reactions. But for goodness sake, Tony Bellew on Football Focus, chatting to Dwight McNeil. I never watch Football Focus and I had the misfortune to just flick and it was there. And it was all gaffer this, gaffer that, running, 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 all the gaffer, yeah. all the gaffer. Yeah. It's bollocks. It's 2024. It's not about running, you idiots. Because if mm. it was all about running and it was all about fitness, you know, we would have started the season strongly, but this super duper fitness coach can't win a game in August. And I just thought that piece with, you know, Bellew going on oh, and Woney and Stoney and the gaffer and this, it's just a cozy little club with absolutely no substance. And it's an insult to our intelligence. There is no coaching going on. Every other team is better coached than we are. And I know that Ipswich, Southampton and some others do the suicidal playing out from the back, but they are coach to try and play football to pass through the lines and to and to have um you know some kind of creative and energetic and pacey approach to the game of football we have none of that yeah you just get a lot of middle management buzzwords don't you that, that's all yeah. that, that's all the teams would be built upon yeah yeah it, it, no substance <clears throat> I just wanted to, to, to pick up on that point when you, you refer to academy and you know <clears throat> journalists getting in there and having a look how things are done um you know, it, it reminds me when they uh, Ofsted go to a school and uh, mm -hmm. you know they have they have, they have a look around and make sure everything's fine. But then when they go, people let like, you know stand down. You can take your tie off. You can all start pissing about again. You know, and throwing things around the classroom. Um, that that sort of thing is crucial to any football club. Um, you know, the academy. It's always been an issue at Everton for many years now. I think over a decade since you can confidently rely upon decent players coming through from the academy. Now, you know, we've spoken a lot. We've done pieces on on the catchment um, situation in and around the Northwest and, you know, what clubs the parents of, of, of potential talents are going to go for effectively, what clubs are going to go in for better young players and whatnot. But, you know, you, you've got you've got a group of fans who would absolutely take Leighton Bain coming in as Everton manager with Big Dunk as his assistant. I think that's an absolute nightmare. But that, that that's a that's a discussion for another time. Um with with the Academy, I I think in a nutshell this is an issue that the, the this football club have because I cannot believe for one minute that Sean Dice is going in 
looking at that academy and telling Leighton Baines to play from their centre their centre back or goalkeeper to hit 50, 60 yard passes up the pitch and for whoever's the tall lad in the academy to try and flick it on and find somebody else. Um, <laughs> it'll be dangerous if that is the case. But on the other side of that coin, you have to think that who Sean Dice is looking at and thinking, do you know what this lad will do? You know, we, should we try this lad? Should we do that? I mean, I think that's been that's been something that you'd underline his position at Everton since he came in, is that he will not consider other options. Um, by and large, we've we've banged on about how long it takes for him to put another player on onto the pitch. The point you make there, Roger, about uh, Tony Bell, you, it feels like he's uh, maybe well unofficial. Um, microphone for the club to come out and say, well, you know, there's no panics there. Everything's fine. He's sound, he's sound, he's sound. He let me in to use the gym. All that sort of thing he did when he was still uh, a boxer before he retired. And, um, you know, the the the, the, the real issue there that's, that, that's central to this, and if it, go back to the fence a lot less that have gone and done there. People are saying to me, I've had a lot of discussions about this, that, you know, oh, it's pointless sacking him now given the run of form we've got in December. And the reply that I'll say to them is, well, do you expect this to get any better than if we had a new manager in at the club? And then the reply to that is, well, you know, if they're coming in, they don't have that sort of bouncing effect that a new manager coming in has, then it's just going to be the same anyway. What I'd put on the, on the bottom line of all that is, if Everton were to go and get a new manager right now and they were to lose whatever it is, half a dozen games that we've got up until New Year. You put more faith in them to change this when we get to, in inverted commas, a more a more comfortable run of fixtures than the one that we've got that's absolutely dreadful in December. And it would actually give them time to sort things out. Look, whoever's in charge at Everton, full stop, whether it's Dice or anybody else there, I've just been looking at the odds, whether it's Dice or anybody else there, you can't expect them to get anything or much in December. So common denominator there to me is you've got to get rid of Dice and you bring somebody else in who's able to implement what they want to do. I think, you know, in, in a way you saw it with Man United yesterday and I was watching them quite closely and their manager come out and absolutely despised their cheering and I loved all that sort of thing. I don't know if you've seen that. It was so uncomfortable. It was great. Um, but he, he essentially, what, what are you saying? I know, I know it was a bit of a piss take and a laugh and people are joking about it. But the fact that that man just stood there and he said, oh, I'm not interested. He walked away from that saying, I'm not doing any more interviews. Um, that, that, that That's a man who knows what he's about. United have got him in because he knows what he's about, what he went and done at Sporting. Um, they, they've brought somebody in who will completely change things regardless of what it starts with and I was um, work wise I was I was listening through and editing his, his post match interview and he was talking about it and I know it's a, a cliche from a manager to say well it's going to take time to get to implement what I'm doing and what not but what he was talking about in, in a much more deeper aspect was they need to run I need these lads to run uh, I need these lads to do the basics of what you should see in Premier League football. Now, we we hear Dice bang on about that, but the the thing that you would add on to a manager that's gone in at, at Manchester United, and you look at his previous career um, at, at Sporting there, he's asking them to run for a purpose with it. He's asking them to run because he's got a style of play that is a positive effect and winning games. It just seemed like Sean Dice is asking everyone to do the bleep test just to make them fitter. It has no relation to how they play football on the pitch. And and, and that's the key difference you'll see in an appointment of a manager. And that, that, that that's that's his that that's sort of his forte is since we got him, since his managerial career began, when he was at Watford and Reading and he pissed about all, all sorts of a couple of different clubs down in the in the championship. He's not getting any better. You know, he's not he's not he's not for changing, is he? He's not going to no, rock. Think- he's not going to rock up to work whenever he goes to Les and say, "Do you know what? We're going to play free fo- free flowing football. I want to keep it on the deck. I want the football to look like it's got a bit of grass on it, rather than being in the air all day and it looks like a brand new football when you come off the pitch." Um, and and that to me, just it, just bringing it back around to this run of games we've got in in December, it uh, it, it makes no difference to me who Everton's man is in regards to the results we're going to go and get. 
but it makes a hell of a difference if you've got somebody in who is able to try and change dramatically what is going on and what he's caused. It's almost like if you if you if you put those fixtures coming up as thinking Everton haven't got a chance, regardless of who the manager is, Everton haven't got a chance. Well, to me, that means you then make that change. You change things up because they'll have an, a, a certain amount of time to try and implement what I was saying, the United manager was saying, to try and implement what you've got them in, to try and change and to try and do. At least they'll have the time. Look, it's a bonus if you don't get the results. It's a bonus if you go and win the derby. It's a bonus if you get a point away at City. All of those sorts of things, yeah, they, they're great, and we'll talk about how well Everton have played there. But at least that would look at some sort of development where you're at Goodison Park thinking, do you know what? These lads have got something that I want to watch. These lads aren't, aren't showing me why I'm wasting my money coming here every week yeah. and paying it to have a lot to do so. Um, and and, and that's, what, that's what I think I would love to see happen. Obviously, it's a million miles away from ever happening because Sean Dice will still have Everton's job. You know, you wouldn't be surprised if we sat here in a year's time and he's still got Everton's job, uh, the, the way in which things have gone. Um, but to, to wait till the summer, I, I think you're dipping into, well, I think we're already in a relegation fight, I think. And mm-hmm. we're very, very fortunate in the other sides that are there. I mean, it's an indictment for the ones that three sides that are worse than Everton because they've got, they've got some serious difficulties, if, if that very much is the issue. But, um, you know, you, you, this league, I've said it many times, this league will find you at some point, this league, will do you over at a certain point and you can't keep treading water like the way we have. And um, yeah, it was just the, the bottom line what I've said there. He he has to go as soon as possible. Yeah. I think, just a I think quickie, a quickie on Leicester. Sorry, Leicester. sorry, sorry, can I just jump in? A quickie on yeah. Leicester sacking. I was reading that actually uh, one of the key things was every single time that the official Leicester football club <laughs> posted anything about the team or the lineups or training, they was they were absolutely inundated with get rid of Cooper. He's absolutely useless. The fan base were extremely. I mean, obviously, there was a Leicester uh, Forest legacy there, which made it relatively unpopular yeah. to, from the outset, right? But but the the, the fan power seemingly um, really played a part in them deciding to get shot of him right now, even mm-hmm. when they're outside of the uh, yeah. outside of the relegation zone. Um, and and maybe maybe there's a lesson there. Maybe, maybe there isn't. But there's no one home at the club to take a bloody decision. So, maybe well, I was going to say, do you, not, do you not think that as well as that? Um, maybe subliminally, maybe not. That Sean Dice is thinking, but fuck this, no one's going to sack me. I'm still getting me pay slip at the end of every month. You know what? What, what does this matter? Look, that's probably going a little bit too far. He actually does want to succeed as a professional football manager. <clears throat> but the, the 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 main thing from that is, you you need to make changes when when nobody's there. I mean, I, I suppose that's one for another time to discuss. Yeah. Is there actually anybody who can sack that man right that's, now? Yeah. That's I mean, the I, thing, isn't it? It's, it's like, I, I don't know. Yeah, what, what you're saying is there's no, there doesn't seem to be a way out of it because he's not changing anything and it doesn't look like he can. There's been a couple of times when he's been manager over the last couple of seasons where he looks like he's cracked it. He's looked like he's cracked the way of playing because, you know, we go back to those that, that three-game run last season where, we you know, we won three in, three in a week at home. Yeah. Then it looked like he kind of cracked it, like a way to play at Goodison and beat these teams who were turning up and had a decent chance of winning. I think Brentford was one of them, wasn't it? Um, and he... We're not doing, we're not doing anything like that anymore. And I think, I think that's the issue where it's like, like you say, this isn't gonna get any better. But if we are looking at replacements, it's interesting what you say there, Dave, about basically having a free hit in December because essentially it is now. If a new manager comes in and gets beaten every game, obviously that's not ideal because, like, you know, what the hell is this fellow doing? But as you say, it, you know, there's a good chance that we'll get beaten those games anyway. If the someone comes in, is not there. Yeah, and if someone comes in and can implement a style where you think, where you can come out of those games where maybe we've been beaten and think, do you know what? I can see what we're trying to do there and this will get better. This is more sustainable. Which leads me on to then, if if we did look, if the club looked for a new manager now, and I think we picked up on this a couple of weeks back, are we going for an interim till the end of the season or for the next 18 months? Or are we going with someone for the long term who's saying, right, this is, this is yours for two years? three years make something of it and lead us into the new ground 
with a new style and, you know, in, impose yourself on this team, impose yourself on this club. What do we look for? Because it's a weird situation that we're in, particularly if there's no, like, anyone, as you say, Rog, really pulling the strings anymore. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of between rock and a hard place with that decision. I'd take David Moyes tomorrow. I'm sorry, I would. Uh, I think he'd keep us up. And, and um, I don't think you need to give him a contract beyond the end of the season. And I know Dave thinks he'd walk over hot coals to come to us. Um, yeah. The danger is Leicester might, Leicester might snap him up. Um, yeah. I do think we need a manager who can uh, create a style of play and actually work with a director of football. And for me, that would be a new director of football. So I would go with uh, an interim, um, uh, a figure like, like Moyes. Um, and, and then I would hope that the Freakins would uh, come across with a clean broom and bring in a new director of football who would then look at managers like, I'll throw a name out of that, uh, just out of left field as somebody like Michael Carrick who's doing a very good job at Middlesbrough. They seem to have scored, uh, they scored six at the weekend. They scored four the game before, three the game before that. Um, uh, and he's been there for a few years. Uh, he's, uh, you know, got a decent uh, pedigree as, as a player too. Somebody like that working with a, a, a more perhaps experienced, more mature director of football, um, that, that might be a, a solution. Uh, I agree completely with Dave that whoever comes in uh, you know, one of us, for example, has a completely free hit in December. Any points you get are a bonus. And I think there's every chance you'd get a bit of a new manager bounce. I know I predicted seven points last week. I was hoping for something against Brentford, so I'm a bit up against it now. So we're going to have to beat Wolves and Forest and get a draw in the derby. Mm. Even, um, even my we'll... five points is looking optimistic now. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you know... Um... It, it, it's interesting there that, that there are a few different directions you want to go in here. I think, firstly, if you're looking for immediate fan support here, yeah, um, look again, going back to the, the asterisk next to that, is that you know everybody will have their opinions here. I was just looking through the odds there. Uh, Potter is favourite, 11 to 4, Moyes 7 to 2, Ru van Nistelrooy, which I think would be an interesting one, he's 5 to 1. Sari, who's completely going in the opposite direction, he's six to one. Lee Carsley, eight to one. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you look at it, let's take the first two or two out of the first three there and think of the monumental difference between the way in which they manage football clubs. So, Moyes, we know, uh, I think take Rogers' point there on you get him in till the end of the season, you probably do it for free, you probably pay Everton to manage them once again. <laughs> Um, give, given how, how much he's adored the football club and how much he's, I mean, he must go home and he, he, I don't think he sleeps with the fact that he wants to go back to Everton at some point. I think that's pretty clear. Um, so you, you've got you've got him um, who you know you consider many fans would be against that. Uh, just given that it's going back to the same there, but you know you think back to the last twenty odd years, he's been the most effective. Uh, positive and obviously uh, had the longest career as Everton manager. He went and won a trophy with West Ham. Look, I don't need to go through the, uh, the credentials that, that David Moyes would bring back to Everton. I was referring to the, the opposite side of things where, you know, if you've got owners come in and they really, really, really want to shake things about, you go and get Potter, you go and have a look at someone like Ruud van Nistelrooy. You mentioned an excellent point there in Michael Carrick and what he's doing. Uh, over at Middlesbrough. But the, the question I'd ask here is, when have Everton ever expected you to go outside of that bubble of expectations? And they've never, ever done that for me. Uh, aside from Ancelotti, who, that that was the, the red heading, wasn't it? The fact that we got him, Benitez aside, because that was a side of shit, wasn't it, really? But um, for thinking outside the box, is the sort of saying and whatnot, um, but coupling that up with what I've said there about what you're going to do in December, that's the time if you want to look far afield from the way in which this football club is right now on the pitch, that is when you go and do that. Because I go back to referring what I said there about regardless of who's in, December's not going to give us much anyway. You've got somebody, you've got a month there for somebody to go in and, and, and be able to implement what they want to do, what they want Everton to do. Do you look at those players and think they have the ability to do that? And I know we're going to go on and talk about um, Sean Dice's his, his favourites, uh, regardless of what they do. But you you look at who we've got, I think that has to be thrown heavily into the mix of what manager we go and get. 
that that has to merge uh, in 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 some capacity, one way or the other. Um, so you know, it's incredibly frustrating to think whoever comes in is almost automatically at a disadvantage of the players and squad that he has to work with, based on Sean Dyche. So I, I think that the, the sort of the next sort of way we lead on to this conversation is the fact that whoever you bring in, has he got an effective squad to try and change and make more positive? Because the danger in that is if they come in, you have that horrendous December and you limp through to the end of the season and keep Everton open. That's that's the remit, isn't it, that we're talking about here? Yeah. Keep Everton in the Premier League. And that goes back to what Roger was saying about <laughs> you go for an interim there. An interim with a view that if they keep Everton up, you almost put it in their contract that they're going to be the Everton manager that takes us into Bramley Moor. Um, and, and I'm with him. I think the, the, the only name that sticks out for that is, is David Moyes. Because you're not going to go and get a Graham Potter and say, listen, mate, you've only got this till the end of the season. He's a manager that worked wonders at Brighton, got them promoted and made them into a really established, comfortable Premier League side. If you're only giving him, what, four or five months to sort things out at Everton and then perhaps say to him, well, thanks, mate, you've kept us up, but we're going to go for somebody else. You, you have to put those plans in place to say if he's in, he keeps us up. That is, you know, automatically a clean slate that we all banged on about. Um, Van Nistelrooy, the same. Sorry, you know, you, you no idea what direction you're going in with that. Um, and, and, and lest we forget, we've got new owners coming in who change managers for fun. You know, so... Um, the, the 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 interesting fact of all of this is you you uh, there's nobody in that list there and and I think that's why Potter is 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 is, is an out bet at eleven to four as the favourite. Um, you look at that list and what it indicates to me is the new owners. Basically, you 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 you're you're, you're, you're flipping a coin to see which one they go for there, um, and I would prefer Moyes, short term at least. I want to ask you guys the question, and I'm going around the various circles here, but Moyes comes in and let's say he keeps us up, which, you know, kiss of death, he should do. Everton should still be in the Premier League uh, come the end of the season. Interim job. Does that create whoever comes in, you automatically give them a new contract and say, right, you've done what we need to do, and, and basically repeat what we did with Sean Dyche. I think you could make, if that happened, this may sound really wacky, I think you could make David Moyes the director of football. Yeah, and I have to said this in post match, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. have him work with a Michael Carrick or others. I think we need, you know, I'm, I'm looking for someone with a personality, right? I know Sean Dyche has got a personality, I just don't actually like it very much because he's, <laughs> arrogant, he's an arrogant fool. Uh, so they need to have some footballing pedigree as well. And so when you talk about Sarri, I quite like that because he's, you know, rather you mentioned Amarim and Amarim's got in a Man United and said, this is the way I'm doing it. You know, I, I'm empowered. And that's why a part of me would still take Jose because Jose would come in and go, fuck you. This is the way it works. Sorry. Bleep. This is me. This is me. I'm the manager. And I think if Jose Mourinho managed us for the games we had in December, we'd probably get six or seven points quite comfortably uh, because he's Jose Mourinho and that rubs off on the players. Um but I think that's rather fanciful. So, yeah, Dyche uh, needs to go and um, give it Moyes till the end of the season with the guarantee <laughs> that he keeps us up. Of course, with the guarantee that he gets the Doff, uh, the Doff hat um, and someone like Carrick comes in and he works with them. And, and, and all of a sudden things are joined up and all of a sudden there's some logic to what we're doing. I mean, I, I mentioned this to Les, but very quickly, right? If you keep going to the same restaurant and they serve you shit food in a shit environment and the service is rubbish and it's overpriced, do you keep going? No, mm. you don't. Now, why would you think, oh, you know that shitty restaurant that we're going to every Friday night that's rubbish? Guess what? They're moving to a, grand, a, a brand new, big, state-of-the-art place in the city centre. Well, what's going to be any different? Mm. And this is the myth. This is the myth behind, you know, we turn up at Goodison we get served the same old rubbish in a pretty inhospitable, ramshackled environment. And we think it's going to be different just because there's nice new seats and, and, and a new stadium. Things have to change fundamentally. Um, and, and we are in the entertainment business. We're going to be asking people to pay upwards of a thousand pound a year, potentially for a season ticket to be entertained. You are not going to get that sort of entertainment if the guy in the kitchen 
is Sean Dyche and his able mm. assistants are Ian Wone and Stoney. It's just, you know, it's just unpalatable yeah, this... nonsense. And I would take not... my custom elsewhere. This gets this gets the new ground thing's very dangerous, isn't it? It's a very dangerous totally. position where, where we're thinking we get to the new ground, we're gonna be fine. It because as you say, Rog, everything needs to change before that can happen. Sorry, Dave, what were you gonna say? I was going to say the interesting thing about it, I think I'm way too much in the future here, but um, many new sides go to a new ground. I remember Arsenal took forever before they won the first game. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing oh. that everybody needs to establish what's going on. Yeah. But the, the point I think we haven't spoken about here is is Thelwell in all of this. You know, mm-hmm. you mentioned the, 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 I mean, obviously very outside uh, chance that it happens, but I agree with you. You get Moyes in as director of football. Thelwell's not going anywhere, is he? Even even if Dice goes, you're not going to say the pair of them are off. You're not you're not looking at them and thinking that it's you know you know Walsh and Walsh and Coombe or anything like that. So he is out why of contract. Is, why is, some, so. is he yeah, really? He isn't well. Yeah, he is. His, his contract's yeah. up. I mean, you can interpret perhaps that that I article that he's been given the nod from Friedkin that they'll give him a bit of a chance and a bit of a longer run at it and maybe allow him to pick a manager. But I think his track record is so patchy on signings. Um, and maybe yeah. that's because he's got a stubborn manager who won't play Jake O'Brien because he's got his favourite segue into the next bit. But, you know, who has signed Beto and has signed, you know, Lindstrom is adding nothing. Jack Harrison's adding nothing. So his record yeah. on signings is pretty poor. And I'm not seeing any, uh, you know, to claim that, oh, look at me, I've sold 70 million quids worth of assets from the academy. It was Anthony Gordon it was 50 million of that. Yeah. You know, don't 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 t- say you oh, want no, to no. forget yeah. a few quid for. <coughs> yeah, but he wasn't an academy prospect. He was. Yeah, Cannon was about eight, wasn't he? As well. Yeah, Cannon was eight, and you know he got a few quid for Ellis Sims. That doesn't really say you've done a good job, Kevin. I'm awfully sorry, but yeah. you know we want more than that. Yeah, it's yeah that that does lead us nicely. And just just quickly, <laughs> Dave, the new the new ground dip is very much a thing as well. Yeah, because it's like an away game for everyone. So that that is something to watch because we're not in a position to dip. We dip, we're goosed. So um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think picking up on the squad, as you say, you know, another coach should be able to. Well, any coach should be able to get more out of this squad than than Dice is doing because it, on paper that that's a reasonably all right squad. There are options there. We should be doing much better in the attack. And it's this weird thing whereby when we were scoring goals at the start of the season, we were scoring two, conceding three. Now we're not conceding any goals. We're not scoring either. Do you know what I mean? It's like, we, you know, we got beat 1-0 at Southampton. We should be scoring against teams like that and it's not happening. Um, he shit himself, Les, just on that. He sh- absolutely shit himself when we went 2-0 up against Bournemouth. Because that, that that's new territory for him. But when, yeah. when, when's, that happen, when's that happen to a Sean Dice game there? When he's in his little cosy comfort with Warren and Stoney there on the, on the touchline thinking, oh, gone 2-0 up here. Yeah. Does that mean we Guess all so. stand on the line there and make sure we don't concede a goal? He shit his kecks when we've gone 2-0 up because he, he, he had no idea what to do, you know, and, and, and to concede those those goals at the end there was was laughable, um, certainly for non-Evertonians there. Um, and, you know, you, you're in a position there where the manager gets to that point. If Everton go two goals to the up, like we did at Aston Villa as well, the manager, you've got a manager that absolutely doesn't know what to do in yeah. that situation. And the well, thing is, you get you get many football fans who would say, well, you go 2-0 up, you, you shut the door, you get people standing on the corner flag, all that sort of thing. Um, the, 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 the funny thing with, with Dice is, if he reverted to type, and I think you hinted at this, Les, in what you were saying, if that was 0-0, uh, Dice should feel much more comfortable uh, Everton defending nil nil than they would have winning a game when they were two nil up, and 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 that's what gets me and indicates to me how poor he is as an actual manager. Yeah, and I can't handle those situations. And as we're going to talk about now, he does have his favourites, and I think that is you know coming to our detriment now. I mean, every every manager does. Every manager we've ever had, you look at them and you're like, why are they playing this guy? Why are they doing this? And you do always question the manager. It's perfectly natural to do that. But I think we've mentioned before, keeping Calvert Lewin up front when he's, as you said, Roger, he's going through the motions, change him, get him out. Keeping Tarkovsky in when, you know, Michael Keane was probably the one who should have stayed in because Tarkovsky's got this hard man tackle that he wants to put in every game and he's not really acting like a captain. And then there's Decore, dropping Mangala for Decore in the centre of midfield was bizarre to me. The oh, Decore, he's, 
I've said it a lot of times. He's, he's a player who he can have a dreadful 90 minutes but can pop up and score the winner. But he's got to be playing in the position where he can pop up to score the winner, which is basically behind the striker. If he's not playing there, there's not really any point to him. And even when he is playing there, there's probably not that much point to him because you are gambling on him popping up in that moment to score the winner, which is unlikely because, I don't know, it, it just, we just don't look like scoring. So it, it's, it, it really does feel like it's to the detriment of the team now. You know, you've got Ashley Young, he's playing he's playing well at right back, but you've got Mikalenko who's stinking the gaff out at left back. Take Mikalenko out, maybe put Ashley Young on the left. You know, he's in, he's in a good he's in a good, you know, run of form. I know you don't want to like swap out players and play them out of position, but then stick someone else at right back and maybe we've got a better balance back for them because you know Mikalenko was getting rinsed again at the weekend and he he looks like a raffle winner again. So Rog, what are, you, what are your thoughts on these this teacher's pets thing? What What is the point of it? Because I don't get it at all. I don't get why you don't play players who are better in the, in the positions. I, I just don't understand it. I think it's terrible for morale. I think it's really poor motivation. Uh, and, uh, you know, a number of instances, you know, Beto, Beto should be challenging um, DCL. And he's kind of belittled Beto as just someone who, you know, just make a nuisance of yourself. Um, that's not great for his for his confidence. Quite He's clearly, that as well, Roger. Yes, I think. Well, I think I think the Everton, I think the manager of Everton Football Club should be should behave better than that. Um, I, I think that's really really poor and very unprofessional. Um, we talked about, or we didn't talk about, but the point about the academy is pathway, and they talked about pathway from the academy, and Thelwell was banging on about this pathway from the academy because it's really clear now. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, Roman Dixon, one game away at Spurs, and I haven't seen him since. Right. Uh, you're absolutely right. Ashley Young could easily switch to left back. I think if you look back over his career, he spent more time on the left than on the right. Certainly at Manchester United, he played left back and probably at Inter Milan as well. Uh, and somebody will probably tell me I'm wrong. Um, so it's really bad for progression of kids. Uh, it's really bad for competition. Um, you know, Michael Keane is teacher's pet, but he's not quite as, as teacher's pet as Tarkovsky. What must Jake O'Brien think? When is he ever going to get an opportunity? Now, now, I know the counter is, look, we're keeping clean sheets. But, you know... Tarkovsky has been something of a liability, but if he knows his job's safe, just like the manager knows his job's safe, there is no motivation, there is no competition, there is no desire to get better and improve. Um, and so I think it's very bad for development of players, and I think it's very bad for morale of those who are not. You know, we've all been in environments working or, you know, school or elsewhere, where I'm sure none of us were teachers' pet, were we? Probably Dave, because he's a bit of a. <laughs> I can, I can oh, far him. from it, absolutely far from it. <laughs> But, you know, the kids who aren't teachers pet or the people who aren't, you know, the boss's favourites, you know, you don't, you don't feel good about yourself, do you? You're not inclined to go and give your best. And so I think, it, I think it's shocking and it's so transparent and, and, and uh, you know, there needs to be competition. And I don't just mean, oh, one game I'm going to start Jack Harrison, the next game I'm going to start Jesper Lindstrom. That's not, that's not really coaching. Uh, maybe you could work on with whoever's playing on that side doing a bit better and crossing more accurately and overlapping with their fullback and developing a partnership. Maybe you could do that, but everybody's got to compete. And if you've got favourites, as all managers have had, you can still drop your favourites to teach them a lesson, you know? Yeah. yeah. What's think on that, Dave? That's right. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. So if you, there's no competition for places, is there? Um, or, well, there should be competition for places there because we, we have mentioned that there's a squad uh, that he doesn't refer to the the way in which he doesn't refer to them is going back to the the initial point that he does have his favourites. How many times we banged on to the fact that it takes well over an hour to make a substitution because he feels safe. He feels that um, he's, he's the type of the type of school teacher um, who would regardlessly give one of their kid one of the kids more of a leeway than, than anybody else. Um, you know, you get a detention if you've been shite at school or you've kicked off or you've been very mouthy. I get the impression if Tarkovsky did that and Michael Keane did that at the same time, Michael Keane would be in detention for a week and Tarkovsky would still be coming home and hasn't had, hasn't had a minute longer in the school. And, you know, morale, is that, I mean, is that even a thing that we have, a morale? Um I mean, I'm sure Dice behind closed doors would say, well, or in his own defence would say, well, Tarkovsky's our captain. We can't possibly start a game without him. Um, so there's no reference whatsoever to any form. 
You know, when, when you can get a position in a side, knowing that you're going to get it anyway, regardless of how poorly you've been, I mean, that's that's a huge issue. That is a massive issue you've got there. And I completely agree that point you made with at the start there, Les, uh, with, with uh, Mangala getting dropped for the core eight. Because yeah. one of one of the main points I've made this season, one of the one of the few positives we've seen is Adrissa Gay's been our best player, in my opinion. You can talk about Branthwaite, but he's been injured. Adrissa Gay has been our best player for me. Um and alongside Mangala when he started getting in, that looked like a really solid way in which to to, to give a foundation to a game in the midfield area. You're putting Decore in there, you said, you know, he's a he's a bit mad. You know, there's a you're getting a you're getting a nine ten out of ten uh, now and again, and then the rest of it you're thinking like you said about Mikhailenko that he's won a lottery um, to to get a game. Um, you go and do that at home to Brentford when they go down to ten men, incidentally, and you're playing him as a central midfield player when it doesn't look like he's even got much experience as a central midfield player. We've had him as a ten. Uh, that's when he's been most effective. When he's in that that area of the pitch, where he's sort of got this free sort of role, and um, when he's involved with everything else that moves forward, that's his game. Um, whether whether he plays well or whether he doesn't, that that's his game. Um, the the fact that Mangala had gone out, um, and well, we don't know with Dice, but presumably didn't have an injury, um, much the same way Branthwaite must have had one when he put him on the bench the other week. Um, it's madness. It is pure madness that when you've seen and you can't blatantly see, which we all can, that your 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 best line up there is your central midfield duo of a just a gay and Mangala comfortably. There's nobody else. It, it, Ibrahim started well, but he's injured, isn't he? You know, he, 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 he and I put I, I put a bet on the fact that Decore get in a central midfield over Mangala and him as well when you've gone and got these new lads in. And Mangala looks really good to me. He looks uh, composed on the ball, looks to be able to play a forward pass. Simple things that others are unable to do. Yeah, sorry, Dave. What we had there in the midfield, then Garner had a stinker at the weekend. Yeah. But then what we had, because he played bad and couldn't couldn't put a pass right, you got the Corey, who again, can't control and can't put a pass right in the middle of the park. So you had two midfielders who couldn't keep hold or do anything with the ball. And that was, that was a problem, I mean, wasn't it? Well, just going back to to Gay, then not, not to make too many excuses there, but you know you you're often a, often a victim of what you've got in and around you, uh, yeah. and, and the way in which Everton tried to to get a goal in that way, um, you know, I can't fathom how, how Sean Dice looked at it and thought, you know what, lads, they're down to ten. Now's our chance to go and get three points here that we badly need. Went and drew the game, um, and yeah. That 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 role in, in in the middle of the pitch there is obviously crucial uh, in in every game we play. Um, you know, it's a, <clears throat> it's a debate whether you put a two or a three in there, depending on the opposition you've got. I think we desperately need a three in there, given the op- uh, given the opponents that we've got coming up, particularly away from home. Um, you know, I'd I'd like to see it a boon uh, fit because that'd be the trio I go with with Mangala and just a gay. Decore shouldn't be anywhere near the central midfield role. Um, and and again, he's 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 a little bit of an enigma, really, isn't he, Decore? Because you're thinking, well, when you've got, I mean, I've put him on my list of teachers' pets, <clears throat> but he's the type of type of player that would come on and pull a rabbit from the hat. Um, so um, he certainly shouldn't get away from it. Maybe you know, you dare to say it. Uh, Sean, you put him on from the bench if you need a goal rather than start him automatically and Everton go behind because he's played like absolute shite. Um, DCL, we've spoken about because there's a lack of alternative. Well, I say lack of alternative. There's Shimiti's back, isn't he? Um, you've got Beto right. there, you paid, you paid 30 million quid for. Um, Broge is training as well. There you go, yeah. The, 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 ghost, the ghost that hasn't come. Um, he, he, he seems like <clears throat> he seems like he's come back from the past to to actually take part in training. He might um, be playing tonight at Watford, apparently for the under twenty one oh, really? project. Apparently, and, um, and Dai now as well, which which I think is an, an important issue in all of this. I mean, he was asked at the press, so wasn't he? To put him in as a ten, tried to explain to everybody when he when he decided to get he, he decided that he was doing the science. Lesson and tell everybody why he's not playing as a as a ten and he's got to play out on a wing role. Um, yeah, the lad looks a little no bit obvious. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, the, the, the lab, the from all the evidence that there is, which there's many and varied from lots of people, that you know he spent eighty percent of his Sheffield United career playing as a ten. But there's no yeah. evidence that he should be playing as. Literally a 10. wears number ten as well. But... Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point as well. Yeah, and <clears throat> you know when you're when you're doing that, and then you're putting Lindstrom, who you know, you know, if you're gonna give the lad a chance. I mean, I, I don't think he's pulled up any trees to, to be kind to him so far when we've seen him. Looked all right away at, at West Ham there when I was getting slated for saying he looks crap. Um, then, then you've got Harrison there as well. You, you, you've got players that are actually young. You've got, you know, full-backs there who overlap. You mentioned there, Mikhelenko's not done it for several seasons. You know, you, you've got things you can change up there and put Ndai as a 10. But it all goes back to the, the nucleus in this, that Sean Dice refuses to change things that are blatantly obvious to all of us that Everton actually, dare to say it, might create something. They might create a chance. They might score a goal, um, certainly before the opponents, which has happened invariably most yeah. of the time. Just, just you know? quickly on a die, to be fair, he did put him <laughs> as 10 in the second half, but... Was that it because was, by accident, though? That was by accident. I don't know. I, I just remember because Dwight McNeil went out left and he looked like he had a goblin. Any misplaced pass and his head went down. His body language was, was awful. McNeil, when he went out on the left, he just looked like he had yeah. a goblin because of it. And the movements up front was dreadful as well. So there's only so much you can do in that 10 roll if your forwards aren't really making the right runs. Well, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the mitigating circumstance there, it's again, it is against 10 men. So, you know, you've got a block. You've got two blocks. Yeah. Well, you've got one massive nine-man block there to try and do something when they're sat on the edge of their 18-yard box. That That's difficult for most teams. You know, you look to you look at Man City against against Spurs, it was impossible for them to do that. And obviously, they're, they're a couple of the world-class side there, Manchester City, and they still struggle to, struggle to do that. So I do have sympathy with Ndai coming in there. But why not naturally yeah. start a game with him there at 10? Know. You know, it's just... Yeah. Well, yeah. the, the reference to that, though, is... He's trying to keep McNeil happy now because McNeil was, wants to play there. And again, well, you go back to, the you go back pet to the Yeah, we've gone. We've gone from the school of science to the school of shite. Any, um, <laughs> any final thoughts before the weekend, lads? We'll wrap this up. Uh, no chance, uh, Old Trafford uh, managers. First game. I wouldn't expect anything from Everton to go and get there. I wouldn't expect any changes other than the fact it might be when O'Brien gets a game because he needs to put ten defenders on the pitch. Um, to hope to get any sort of result. That that'd be the only way in which he's gonna play. Um DCL is gonna start. It's it's just so predictable. I made this point a few times. It's so predictable what the opponent will be looking at. He's a brand new manager, Amaroon's come in there, brand new manager. Do you reckon the coach or whoever's still there uh, since Ten Hag's got off have gone up to him and said, Right, here's ten minutes of those lads there. They, they, they get beat or they just try and defend. We scored a goal against him, got absolutely no chance of losing this game. Um, and and that's what I think will happen against against Man United, and then you know all eyes go on to an set. I mean, I keep banging on about six pointers that against Wolves, that that it's is that, that's a huge season long mm-hmm. game because we're we're miles away from halfway through the season, and we're relying on these sides to lose. Uh, I was yeah. hoping Liverpool. I was hoping Liverpool won. I hope Liverpool won against Southampton. Oh, I hope Man United went and beat it when Ipswich equalised. I absolutely shit myself. You know, we're at we're at that stage now of this, of this. You know, well, we've 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 been experiencing it for several years now, lads, and we all looked a bit older because of it. Um, so yeah, just going back to it, Man United, no chance. Same old, same old, Rog. Um, yeah, I think what we might be treated to, because of course we have got three games in six days, haven't we? United away, Wolves at home, and the Shite at home um, Sunday. Wednesday and Saturday. So three games in six days. I think we could get a whole new range of excuses coming from him. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe he'll, you know, throw Jake O'Brien under the bus and, you know, he'll have to uh, take the blame for us getting humped at United. Although United are rubbish. I mean, they are a really, really poor team. They've got really, yeah. really bad players. But we should be able to go there with a the freedom yeah. and, and, and just believe and Big pitch, you know, show them what we've got. The problem is we've got bugger all. Um, yeah, um, it's going to be grim. Um, I just wish, I wish we could get rid of him. I wish someone would come in and show some imagination, show some ambition and show some creativity. Um, I suspect we'll have another Blue Monday in a week's time. 
Yeah, but hopefully with a nice new dice bingo card, which would be something to look forward to. Yeah. Um, let us let us let us know what you think in the comments. Um, are we being harsh on dice? Because some people do think we are. I I think that uh, that moment is well past. Just let us know what you think. Uh, thanks to Rog. Thanks to Dave. Thanks to everyone who watches and listens. Uh, we'll have loads more stuff coming up this week leading up to the Man United game. Uh, up the toffees.